Um, I want to take a quick look back at insecticides. Uh, they're not new, and they're not a new problem. Um, things, things have changed when bees and pesticides get together now. We want, we want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, there's a, a critical change in application techniques, as you know. And then we're going to get into this uh, systemic insecticide issue to a certain extent. Forever and ever and ever, there were people who knew that if you ground up some chrysanthemum plants or tobacco plants and whatnot, and, and took that juice and put them on, on insects, there were a problem on your plants, it killed them. And um, then eventually people began to discover what those extracts were, and uh, then we as humans began to put some synthetic materials together, and we started with the arsenicals. Uh, believe it or not, we were, we were doing that at about the same time. So we're talking the 1860s, we were using pyrethrum, and uh, one of the arsenate, arsenicals, uh, lead arsenate, came along in 1894. And that was used for decades and decades and decades. Um, so the ancients used to grind up the plants, and, or grind up the insects once in a while, and just put that juice back on insects as a spray again, and it killed them, and that was probably because there were viruses in them. Uh, 1901 was when what we now call BT was discovered, and it was formulated into a commercial product in 1938. So I mean, there have been things out there for quite a while now that have been used in pest control, and bees have been around them. Um, these materials can be sprayed on, or they can be dusted on in a small scale basis by hand equipment. Uh, then, as agriculture grew, so did the equipment. So we can put sprays and we can put dust on there now with blowers or with airplanes or with helicopters and we can cover a lot of area very quickly with them. Um, even more recently, as it uh, became apparent that we were going to have all the water in the world and maybe it'd be a good idea to try to, to change irrigation in such a manner that we would only be irrigating the plants and not the rest of the universe, and we went over to uh, drip, they call it drip, but actually they're injectors down in the ground and they're pumping it in pretty hard. Drip irrigation, uh, then they decided, well look, uh, I don't have to go out there and, and do something extra if I want to put a fertilizer on or whatever, I'll just put it in this tank and then I'll shoot it through the tubes and put it out into the field. So that was chemication. And uh, we began to do that quite a bit in the 1980s. Then they decided they could chemicate other things as well, including pesticides. And we'll hear about that. But let's drop back just a little bit. Uh, in the 1940s, we were dealing, we the beekeepers and agriculture, with the chlorinated hydrocarbons. And some of these names are familiar to you, DDT, uh, chlordane, some of those. Uh, we, they're terribly persistent. So we tried to get them out of what we were doing as much as possible. And way back then, we were already putting in a little bit of piperone and butoxide. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's an adjuvant and it's something that makes these materials much more toxic to the pests. Then along came FIFRA. And then in the early 50s, uh, we began to use the organophosphates. And parathion, diazinon, cyan, you've, you've heard of a lot of these. If I'm remembering my numbers right, right now, there's somewhere around 64 of those that are registered and still in use. They were followed by the carbamates in the mid-1950s, and there's a couple at the bottom that really create problems with the beekeepers and whatnot. Uh, the list of the number of those isn't as large, and they are both <laughs> toxins of your nervous system. Uh, EPA would like to get rid of all the organophosphates it can as fast as it can. Now, one of the problems with that is if you get those into your body in very much of a concentration that starts to work on your nervous system, you can't kind of undo it. The carbamates have the same targets, but there's, uh, you, can, you can use atropine and back it off slightly if you get into it and maybe, maybe not have a lethal consequence of contamination. So those were out there. Uh, let's see if I... All right, I may have to come back to this because I don't remember all this talk. The pyrethroids came along in the 1970s. Um, we still have one, that first one that's listed up there. Remember, have you seen these advertisements for bandanas you can put around your neck or clothing that you can wear that repels mosquitoes? Uh -huh. yeah, that's permethrin. You're wearing it. 
um, and then, and then uh, insect growth regulators came onto the market. Um, 1975, I think, was about the first time that they had methaprene, uh, hydropene later. But those aren't the ones that we're using now. We've, we've got some others. But the insect growth regulators came onto the market in the 70s. Uh, at that time, we weren't having any bee problems with them. Let me, let me jump ahead a little bit and see something. Yeah, all right. So there were two types of these insect growth regulators. One of them tricks the insect into thinking that there's additional, additional juvenile hormone going into their body. That's called an agonist because it increases or enhances whatever it was that was going on. So if you get too much juvenile hormone, what happens is as you grow bigger and molt, if you're an insect, and grow bigger and molt, grow bigger and molt, grow bigger and molt, you're supposed to reach a point where you're fully fed, fully grown, and now your chemistry should change over and say, okay, now pupate. But if you put these things in there, it just keeps telling them, no, 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 keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, and it just grows them to death. So that's one way it works. Some of the other ones that work with the juvenile hormone is just the opposite, they get in the way so this insect is going along and is trying to grow and, and they don't get any more message about what they're going to be and they die that way. Then they found some others that interfere with the formation of the, of the exoskeleton of the insect. Um, an insect has kind of a mesh-like body on the outside, which is, um, yeah, right. <laughs> What's the word? Come on, help me. Chitin, chitin. Okay, chitin. What do I got? I don't have chitin inhibitors down here. Okay. But anyway, it builds it up with chitin. It's a chitin mesh. And then to make these insects hard, they pack protein into that mesh. So that's, that's what makes these insects crispy and hard when they die, their exoskeleton. Well, if you can't build the new exoskeleton, as you're trying to move from being a little larva to a bigger larva to a bigger larva, you need a bigger suit of armor on the outside. And if you can't build it, then you're going to die sometime. And very frequently, uh, the larvae make it, but when they get up to the pupal stage, the pupae don't emerge as adults. They either can't get there or they're not healthy if they can get to the adult stage. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more because we're going to, we're going to see it. Okay, there's my word. Um, uh, the reason I put down the name of the one that's down here now, and that's a chemical name, is because it's implicated in what we're going to see in a second. Okay, what else is going on? Um, fungicides have evolved just the same way that the insecticides have evolved and whatnot. And the first time I believe that we felt that there were some problems with fungicides with bees was way back in 1951 when we had some problems with captan. Uh, probably... 25 years after that, Frank Eichen went back and looked at captan again to see whether or not it was creating problems with bees. And at that time, it was very interesting because he found out you could sort of categorize the products that had captan in, out there into three different groups. One group appeared to have no negative impact whatsoever on bee brood and no negative impact whatsoever on adult bees. Then there was a second group that gave you problems with the brood, but no problems with the adult bees. And then there was a third group, and I don't remember it got this one, but actually it, would, it created brood problems, and in some cases actually, you know, made the adult bees get sick. So what does that tell you? Well, basically, the fact that there were some captan formulations out there that had captan in them and didn't seem to create any problem whatsoever suggests that the active ingredient in the captan is not really the problem. What's the problem? The inert ingredients, which are listed on the label simply as inert ingredients. Do they tell you what they are? No. Do you have a clue? No, because it's a proprietary secret. The EPA knows. They won't share it with us. Okay. So um, that's when we begin to find out that all things weren't quite the same. Then, uh, in the late 80s, beekeepers were really complaining about the fact that if somebody was spraying Roverol on bloom on trees, they were having a problem with brood. 
And uh, <laughs> then in 2003, they were complaining the same thing about Christine. So I hopped in on things before Christine, and I, I studied the, uh, I don't know, it was a six or eight fungicides that they were normally being used on uh, almonds at that point in time. And indeed, uh, Captan and Zyram killed larvae just flat. Uh, Robrol was interesting because the larvae would grow all the way up and it'd be nice, beautiful, huge, white puberty. And that was the end of the line. They didn't go any further. Uh, Pristine, I didn't get a hold of, but um, Reed Johnson ran some studies on that one. Uh, we won't go into that great big long story, but Pristine, if you don't have anything else around, the formulation that's on the market will not hurt bees. But practically every time we use it, it hurts bees. So see something else is going on. Um, all of these particular things had a certain chemistry in there that were hard on larvae, and uh, pristine was a compounded material that has some carbamate in there. And that's not normally a good word to use around bees either. But anyway, I can tell you, pristine all by itself does not hurt larval or adult bees. <coughs> so in the so-called good old days of beekeeping, before we had all the problems we had now, uh, those chlorinated hydrocarbons, the OPs, the carbamates, they were kind of a slow-acting poison. And what you would end up with is a whole bunch of bees on the bottom board and piled up in front of the colony. And they had enough time to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to bring contaminated pollen into the hive. So uh, then after that, the brand <coughs> new emerging bees, they were trying to beef themselves up to be nurse bees would eat that contaminated pollen, and they would die. And you'd see a handful of those out in front of the hive, day after day after day for up to a month or so. But then it appeared it was over. And we didn't worry about any chronic sublethal effects. Now, <laughs> there may have been some. We weren't looking then. Okay. Um, then we moved to the pyrethroids. And the pyrethroids are, are much more toxic. You don't have to use nearly as much active ingredient per acre, and you get knocked out out there. And that's exactly what the beekeepers were seeing. It surprised them a little bit because they would see a sprinkling of a handful of bees out there and they'd say, ah, oh, I got hit a little bit by a pesticide. But we were running some experiments on clover and we were using some of these pyrethroids. And that little bit hit that they saw outside there uh, was knocking down anywhere from two to four frames of bees. So when you went back and looked in your boxes, they were pretty empty compared to what was going on before. Okay, so what happened this, this season, okay, 2014, in the almonds? Between Fresno and Bakersfield, we had a real problem. Now this happens to be this year also, but if you want to see a pile of dead bees, this was not kiwi pollination. And I'll tell you right now, they didn't get poisoned in kiwi. They didn't like going to kiwi. So they were sitting on kiwi pollination. A few of them were working kiwis like they ought to be. The rest of them went out off the property and got into trouble. So we still have these kinds of bee kills out there, not quite as commonly as we used to. Um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, the bees are dying by their tongues hanging out. So they were poisoned. Well, possibly, because poison bees, some of them do that. Uh, but there's other reasons that their tongues stick out, so that's not quite enough. Um, colonies can recover from their exposures to these poisons. One of the reasons is that the queen is pretty well shielded from what's going on. I mean, the foragers are out in the field if the poison's too strong, they're dumb. And then if it isn't, and they can bring some of it back to the hive, then you've got all those nurse bees in there trying to create the food for the queen and the food for the larvae. If it's too toxic, they die. If it's not too toxic, they'll pass a little bit of it on. But the queen is pretty well protected. So that's one of the reasons why the colonies tend to be able to recover, because you don't leave, lose your uh, reproductive individual. And as probably most of you know, if you can get your bees on clean food and the weather conditions are right or whatnot, colonies can build up very, very quickly. And that's, that's good, because if that weren't the case, we wouldn't even be in beekeeping anymore. Um, but, but the cell effects aren't going to be noticed unless you open up the hive, pull up frames, inspect the brood, and uh, 
Then, like I said before, you'll, you'll begin to see these peculiar things, like with some of the fungicides, that the pupae just don't make it. They, they die while they're trying to molt. Um, you can find empty brood cells, so you get this real spotty looking brood uh, where the larvae have been hauled out. And yeah, there are some chemicals out there, Monitor is one of them in particular, that stops the queen from laying. And the interesting thing about that is that um, if she's not laying any eggs, that kind of stimulates the workers to think, boy, is she a dud, let's get a new one. And, and the truth of the matter is that with some of these chemicals, if you get them away from what they got contaminated by, she will be fine and she would keep on going, but the bees have already decided to change. So you lose, you lose queens, you lose bees over time and whatnot simply because uh, it appears to the workers that there's something really wrong with the queen, and at least temporarily there is, but it doesn't always stay that way. So what happened between Fresno and Bakersfield this year? Well, the, the beekeepers brought their bees into the orchards, uh, trying, of course, to meet that eight frame minimum that the, that the growers like. And the weather was pretty good. So the colonies built up fairly well. Normally, the colonies can build up at least two frames from the size that they were brought in. So we had eight framers that had been up to 10 framers, and we had some that were larger and whatnot. The beekeepers looked at that and said, yeah, this is pretty good. Things are, things are going pretty well. Uh, then in March, when they came back to take these colonies out of the orchards, they saw bees on the ground again. Now, not quite as bad as that kiwi thing you saw, but lots of them in front of many of the colonies. And um, when they looked inside, their 10 to 12 frame colonies were four to five frame colonies. So they lost a horrendous amount of bees. The second thing they noticed was that there were a bunch of bees that had been pulled out or crawled out on their own, but whatever, they never got their color right. There was something really wrong with them. That's your typical IGR, insect growth regulator problem. Okay, and then you can take a look here, once they start looking at the combs, some brood had emerged here, but then you take a look and you, you can't see it very well off from back there, but these are individuals who tried to come out, couldn't make it, and they got their tongues hanging out. Not that that matters, but they're probably asking for food from their sisters. Okay? Now, how many colonies are we talking about? It depends on whose numbers you look at. The beekeepers thought that it was somewhere between 80 and 87,000 colonies of bees. EPA came out, DPR came out. They looked around and DPR said, no, you know, no, we could, we could only really document 10,000. They could only document 10,000 bees, colonies affected by this, 10,000. That's too many, sorry. <laughs> so, one of the beekeepers, when, when he first noticed this, said to me, so what can we do? What can we, is there any way we can know what's going on? And I said, there is. It will cost you some money, but if you still got some of these colonies out there, you know, that have bees that are dying, and uh, uh, anyway, take a sample, send it to the lab down there in North Carolina, pay through the nose, have a complete, you know, diagnostics done on it, and let's find out what's in there. So it came back that what was in there was tilt, which is a fungicide with propiconazole in it. That's the active ingredient, okay? I would assume, rightly or wrongly, that if the bees got into tilt and nothing else, it would have been okay. Then there was one called turismo that was in there. That was a combination of two insecticides. In theory, this one, rubendiamide, that's one of those things that we would, if we were putting group one, highly toxic, group two, moderately toxic, group three, relatively non-toxic, we call it group two. And with group two, you try not to get the bees, and you try to get it on in such a way that it will be dry before the bees come back and forage, or you're gonna have a little bit of trouble. So agrimec is like that. We've got quite a few group twos. Anyway. That's, that's what, in theory, this is supposed to be. 
And then there was that view prophecy, which we just talked, or prophecy, whatever, that we just talked about that was the, the kite case inhibitor. Okay, so those were the three things that were in there. So I looked back to see whether or not flubendiamide really, really is a group two material. And um, you go to the EPA, and the EPA requests fact data sheets, and, and you can read down the fact sheet. And for every chemical except flubendiamide, you'll find an LD50 for bees. Now, true, it's for adult bees. It's not for the inventors, but it's for adult bees. How much does it take to kill them making a topical application on their body? That's just how much does it take, actually, if they had 100 bees and you put that much on, how much does it take to kill 50% of them? 50% will make it, 50% won't. That's the LD50, that's important criteria that, that EPA uses. Okay, so I looked it up for flubendiamide, and you know what I found? No data. And then over in the right-hand column, it said, acceptable. <coughs> acceptable to whom? <laughs> what are we talking about? That's how that got registered. Okay, cool. And then the, um, the uh, IGR, they were all tank mixed together and put in together. And, and what we're beginning to find out now is that it was the same with the pristine and it was the same with the Roverall. They're, they're mixing things together. And, and why are they mixing the things together? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, firstly, because their uh, pest control advisor told them to do it. They're the ones that write the recommend, we, their recommendations, we call prescriptions, for what's being put on the crop. And they said, okay, if, if you haven't used your dormant sprays, to take care of um, scale crawlers and immature peach twig borers, first in start peach twig borers. If you use the dormant strain, there's oil in it, and they smother the crawlers and they smother the hi hiber hibernacula, one hibernaculum, or that peach twig borer. Uh, if you haven't killed them that way, then the next time you get a shot at them is during bloom. So if we put an insecticide in there and a fungicide in there at the same time, we can kill two birds with one spray. They kill a lot of bees with one spray. So anyway, that's kind of what's going on out there. The other thing we found out that was interesting after we dug into this more was that combination was used in quite a few places and there wasn't always a problem. And it turns out that because we're having kind of a water situation, in places where they mixed it up the same way with uh, 100 to 200 gallons per acre and sprayed it on, there wasn't much of a problem. The big problem was where they cut back on the water and only put in 50 gallons. And when they put it on, that made it apparently um, strong enough to really do damage to the bees. So anyway, uh, there were a number of individuals who at that time said, you know, my bees have been banged around every so often when I've been down here in almonds anyway, but this is just too much. I'm not coming back. Well, of course, this got to the ears of the almond board and whatnot. And uh, so things, things have been going on. And now, now you'll see that the almond board came up with the best management practices brochure that's, that's pretty nice. And it fits all. It's not just almonds. I mean, any fruit tree, any, any field crop, if we could just go along here. What does it say? <laughs> Basically, it says, you know, don't contaminate the bees' food. Okay, we've got some other modern insecticidal materials coming along. And this new group that you're looking at now, um, many of the past chemicals, you know, nerves that go from my brain all the way out to my fingers so I can wiggle it, there's a whole bunch of different cells involved in that. And so there has to be something coming from my brain that runs down and through it out to my finger to tell me to do this. So if you can interfere with these inter interconnections of, of cells, nerve cells going down here, my finger won't go anywhere. I'll be out of business. Two ways. If you, if you fix these little connections between the cells such that they, they don't operate at all, they're shut down and they won't work, okay, that paralyzes my finger. If you fix it such that it can't recover, so you're getting all the time, you're just getting more and more and more and more down here. That will paralyze my finger too, and it won't work, okay? That's what these nerve poisons do in the insects. And the interesting thing is that these new ones, and these are the ones that are gonna replace the neonics. They're coming now. 
they work where the nerve cell penetrates into the muscle. And that's where the connection is that is now being fouled up by these new ones. And they keep telling me that there's no problem, that these materials that are out there on the market now um, are, are going to hurt caterpillars and they're going to hurt aphids, but they're not going to hurt bees. I just don't quite agree with you, but <laughs> we'll see. That's what they're telling us. Okay, now, here's, here's, the, here's the group of chemicals that everybody likes to pick on. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, let's see. Okay. The, the neonicotinoids. So what are they exactly? Well, they're analogs of nicotine. What's, what's an analog? Well, you know, you can look at the chemistry of nicotine, a diagram of it, and then look over here, and it's called an analog. Well, it looks pretty darn similar. It's just got a couple of CHs and a couple of something else's where there didn't used to be any. But this chemistry is actually rather exquisite because they found out that not only do we have what are called nicotinic receptors on our nerve cells, there's two different kinds. And vertebrates that have a backbone, like you and me and fish and uh, whatever, frogs, we have one kind predominant. On the other side, if you don't have a backbone, it doesn't matter whether you're a worm or an insect or whatever you are, but you have a different sort that predominates. And they have moved the chemistry over to attack that type and leave us relatively unscathed. Nicotine itself is terribly toxic. In fact, if you take the nicotine that's in a pack of cigarettes, extract it out, put it in a drop, stick it on your finger, and wait a few minutes, you're dead. That's how toxic this stuff is. Okay? So we got one that's really highly toxic to the invertebrates, not too bad for the vertebrates. That's, that's what the neonics are. Um, they started being used in the 1990s. They got to the US after a while. Uh, as you probably know, they're registered on practically everything that we grow in this country and our ornamentals and our trees. Um, well, okay. So Spinosad came out after that. Uh, these are antibiotics. Uh, you, they grow the fungus in a culture, and just like penicillin or something, you extract the chemicals out, and you can use those. And I mentioned Agrimac. These, these are not quite as toxic. They're, they're the group two type. And then uh, we've got another group that are going to come onto the market, which is Movento, and they're telling us Movento doesn't hurt bees. Boy, I get the hot water over that one. It's okay. I know the test that was run on Movento by the beekeepers. I know who was involved, and I know exactly what they saw. So when they said they were going to register this in California, I wrote a letter to DPR and told them exactly what I knew and what I saw. And uh, Citrus Mutual jumped on me. These are public documents. Citrus Mutual jumped all over me, and uh, I eventually wrote back after I was so mad <laughs> to Citrus Mutual. But anyway, uh, this material is supposed to be safe for bees, and I don't believe it. <laughs> okay, do we ever have systemic materials before? Yeah. We've had cystox, and we've had dicystine. Uh, they were repellent, so you didn't usually have too much of a bee problem, but indeed they were lethal to bees if they got into it. Um, Saigon and orthene temporarily go systemic in a plant. So if you have your bees out in there and they're sprayed at the time the bees are there, you get this horrible knockdown. But then, a few days later, if it's in bloom, you will find that you get this systemic effect in the bloom and you lose bees for a second time, but not very many. And the thing about these organophosphates is once they've done their job, they kind of disappear. So that's, that's the only good part of that. But you know, systemics aren't new. <clears throat> well, what is new is that the systemics that we're using now, they, they keep around the roots of the plant one way or another. They may, they may put it in the ground or they may uh, put it on the seed when it's planted, but anyway, when, or to spray it on the plant. And wherever it goes, no matter how it gets in there, it covers the whole plant, it gets into the whole plant. And if that plant happens to come into bloom, um, those materials will end up in the nectar and pollen at very, very low levels. So if you've got these small plants that are growing out, field crop plants or something where they use a lot of it, canola, sunflower, all that kind of stuff, you'll find it, they're between four and 10 parts per billion 
in the nectar and pollen, in all those plants. You just predict it, that's where it's going to be. But interestingly, when you start looking at the ornamentals, and you start looking at the trees, it's a little bit different because they will inject quite a bit of it into the ground around the base of the tree, or sometimes physically into the bark, or under the bark of the tree, to get it into the tree. And it takes these trees quite a while to build up to their maximum titer in those tissues and whatnot, sometimes over a year. And then, those titers stay up in those trees for a prolonged period of time. So down in Southern California, they wanted to knock the lerp psyllids off of some of the eucalyptus trees, and they injected into the trunks of the trees, or they put it into the ground, and it went through, and in the wintertime, got up into the uh, nectar out there.